Welcome to Speaking the Language of the Soul global event, in which we will gather for powerful conversations with scientists, indigenous elders, wisdom keepers, shamans, healers, to reveal and restore our relation to the divine and the truth we, of who we really are. This event is designed to open up space for all of us to remember the oneness and sacredness of everything, the uniqueness of each and everyone, and the unique contribution that each can offer to creating a new way of living on Earth uh, by simply aligning with who we truly are. So here you're invited to tune into the wisdom and the healing energy created in these conversations and experience your own deep healing as well as healing the collective. I am your host and the creator of this event, Vesel Kanikolova, and today I'm excited to present to you Kader Brown. Welcome, Kader. So Thank excited you, to have you on the summit. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll introduce you briefly to our audience so that you know a little about you. Kader is an international ceremonialist and Kauri Shell diviner, a healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, he has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his depth of clinical knowledge of experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and healing methods from around the world. I will read the quote here. Uh, and this is what Elder Malidoma Some, PhD and ancestor of the Dagara tribe of West Africa, has said about Kader. I have known Kader for a long time as a man of spirit with remarkable devotion to healing. He tends to his duty with royalty and ferocious commitment. As a man who he he hears the call of earth and nature, Kader extends his hand to those in quest of change and transformation and is always willing to lead them into and guide them through a deep sense of communion with themselves. Having worked with him in a number of rituals and ceremonies and watched carefully the way he gives of himself to spirit, I have come to respect his priestly devotion to the sacred in nature and in every human. His work deserves respect and reverence. I got chills while reading that. So uh, Kader is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council, an organization offering nature-based treatment and professional training programs. Kader is a member of an international wilderness guides council and known for his ability to blend many creative and expressive forms of depth psychology and therapy with more ancient methods of healing through vision quest ceremonies, sweat lodge ceremonies, rites of passage experiences, and personalized ceremonies and rituals in his work with individuals, couples, groups, and communities. So, okay, there I'm excited about your topic today uh which is ceremonies of healing remembering and belonging so welcome again and let's continue with your topic and uh your little gift that uh, you're presenting to all of us opening this interview with a little ritual with a invocation which i'm very grateful for Thank you, Vasilka. Um, yes, I'd like to open our conversation into this space with an invocation. Um, 
which is a way of uh, connecting more deeply, not simply with ourselves, but with those sources of uh, wisdom, love, guidance um, from the other realms that uh, help us remember more deeply who we are and the medicine we carry. <clears throat> so I invite everyone uh, listening out there to close your eyes for a moment and send your spirit to a place in nature that is familiar to you, that is comfortable to you, uh, a place you have seen at some point. And imagine yourself in that place in nature, uh, standing there at sunrise, facing east. And so I'll begin this invocation as you face the morning sunrise. <clears throat> so with open hearts, with clear hearts, and with humble hearts, we gather here today, <clears throat> and we call upon the sacred mystery great spirit to open the way for this conversation to unfold. We acknowledge those First Nation peoples of the lands on which you sit at this moment. And we thank them for their collective wisdom and guidance. And I wish to acknowledge the Cherokee, which are those First Nation peoples of this land that I sit. <clears throat> So turning towards the east now, we face the rising sun, the place of new beginnings and fresh new starts, the place of seeing for the first time everything as if we've never seen it before, that place where we have let go of the old stories, the old beliefs, the old ways of noticing ourselves and others, and step forward into the sunlight, into curiosity into wonderment, into joy, into the possibility of the journey that's unfolding before us. So we call upon the good medicine people of the East to bless this gathering, to offer us that good medicine of the East and to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Aho. So now, quarter turn to the right in this place in nature. Take a slight quarter turn to the right and face the south. Maybe standing there in the noonday sun. The season of summertime. <clears throat> the place where we make manifest our dreams that we had in the, in the east. And we bring them into the collective vision for others to see. <clears throat> so we call upon the good medicine of the south the place of creativity, the place of courage and impeccability, the place where our thoughts and our feelings and our words and our actions are exactly the same, a place of, of action and beauty and love unshadowed by thought. We call upon the good medicine of the South, the good medicine people of the South, to bless this gathering, to offer us that medicine into this circle to awaken within each one of us that bone memory of this medicine from the south with much gratitude we welcome you i hope another quarter turn to the right <clears throat> we face west turning towards the west we face the setting sun the moon rising the autumn leaves, bright colored leaves on the ground and overhead, the cooler nights of autumn, the place of the harvest, the place where we learn to harvest and take in the nourishment and offer nourishment, the place of transformation and change, of initiation, of turning inward and downward like the sap proceeding on the vines, we call upon this good medicine of the West to bless this circle, to bless this gathering, and to awaken within each one of us that medicine of the West where you live as well. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Aho. Quarter turn to the right again, you face north. 
turning into the north, into the dark, cold, crisp, clear, deep winter kind of north in this hemisphere of the planet. We call upon the good medicine of the north, a place of surrender, a place of letting go, a place of prayerfulness, the place where we let go so deeply that new stories simply show up because we let go enough. The place of the elders and the story keepers of the north and the sacred mountain. So we call upon this good medicine of the north to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Uh -huh. Turning toward the center of the circle, We turn our attention skyward to the great sky nation, to our star sisters and brothers and others. <clears throat> we thank you for shining down your light, reminding us how to shine brightly as a light as well so that you could see us by the way we live our lives down here. We're for gratitude to Grandfather Son. We thank you for showing up every day even when it's difficult, and reminding us, too, how to show up over and over and over again, how to fall down seven times and get up eight, always eight, and turn our attention to Grandmother Moon <clears throat> in your nightly liquid beauty. We thank you, Grandmother Moon, for teaching us how to own our shadow, how to bring those sometimes painful, shadowy things that we hold in silence, that we hold in isolation, how to bring them into the light over and over again for healing, for remembering. We thank you, Grandmother Bone, for these teachings. And we all welcome all the good medicine people of the Sky Nation to this circle, to this gathering, to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Uh -huh. Now standing in this place in nature that you see yourself, you move your hands down toward the earth, placing your palms on the ground, on the earth, on the soil. And we offer gratitude to Pachimama, to this great mother, Earth Spirit, we thank you for teaching us of belonging, of community, of home and connection. We thank you for reminding us that scarcity is an illusion that is only brought about by when we live out of balance with you. We thank you for reminding us that there are no borders of division between peoples, human and non-human that we have this one home that we share. We thank you for reminding us and teaching us how to walk gently and in balance with much gratitude. We welcome those good teachings <clears throat> from the earth, that place where soil and soul come together by our own name to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where this earth medicine lives as well. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Uh -oh. Turning towards the center of the wheel, imagining a fire in front of you, seeing a fire burning in the center of this circle that we all stand. And we offer our gratitude to the ancestors, to the seven generations and beyond that have come before us on whose shoulders we stand. We thank you for your teardrops and your laughter, for your footprints and your heartbeats buried in the soil, and for those ancestors that stand in front of us, those seven generations and beyond that stand in front of us, <clears throat> waiting to arrive here. Once again, we thank you for watching to see how we live our lives down here, so you will know what to do. We thank you for that accountability in the way that you watch that, 
And we thank you for that trust. And may we be deserving of it in the way that we live our lives, be an answer to your prayers. With much gratitude to those ancestors, we welcome you to the circle. Oh. And we call for the spirits of the land around which you sit at this moment. To the standing tall people, to the spirits of the rivers, the mountains, the swimmers in the rivers, the crawlers on the earth and in the earth, the four-legged and the two-legged and the winged ones and the plant medicine people. We thank you for those reminders that we are not separate, that while we may have lost our way and forgotten who we are and our connection to creation, we thank you for those reminders that call us back home to ourselves and to the gifts of medicine that we each carry and that we each came into this world to offer. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Aho. And to the great council of elders that sit on the other side of the fire, stirring the coals and keeping them hot, we thank you for keeping that fire going over there. We thank you for standing by us and believing in us. Even when we stumble and fall and have a hard time believing in ourselves and each other, we thank you for tending the fires over there. And may the way in which we tend the fires here, by the way we live our lives, be an offering, a prayer answered to all our relations, human and non-human. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Aho. Uh, opening your eyes and coming back, maybe even keeping one foot over there as we come back here. It's always a little disorienting to, find, to make my way back after that, um, to land here in this physical uh, world of the internet <laughs> in this uh, virtual circle we have here with people around the world. Thank you, Kade. It was um, such a beautiful and deep experience, and it's really kind of um, we have to pull ourselves together to <laughs> continue the conversation. But thank you for um, reminding us about our cyclical nature, mm -hmm. but and how we gain wisdom turning in this cycle of life. Uh, how much help we've got turning to the spirits of the four directions and that we are one with the cosmos and with the earth. And this oneness is so sacred. And because we are part of it, thank you for reminding that we are also sacred. And we have our medicine here that we need to bring out and to offer if we want to contribute something to um, the struggles that the world is going out through. And it's a very <clears throat> beautiful reminder that our sacredness and our medicine is the time for now to come out. And we can step courageously into that. Yes. Yeah. yeah there, there's oh. a, a saying, I don't know if I heard it somewhere, I'm just making it up on the spot, but uh, the saying where we say it's time for medicine people to stand up and be medicine people. And we're all medicine people. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, um, you know, I want to acknowledge some of my teachers, uh, one you spoke of, uh, Melodoma Somme. Um, Will Rocking Bear of the Cherokee tradition here, both have crossed over and, and uh, now assist me as ancestors from over there. Um, some teachings I've learned about uh, 
how we connect more deeply with the sacred in ourselves, with the, the, the gift of who we are. Um, it often begins with this, uh, you know, one thing in, in storytelling circles, there, uh, in, in certain kinds of stories, there's a way that the storyteller will enter the story by destabilizing the, the listener's attention by saying something that takes them a little off balance, much like an invocation can do. Well, it's like, okay, I have to kind of regather myself. And the purpose of that is to dislodge the, the ordinary thinking mind, um, hopefully even being able to disengage the thinking altogether so that what is left is simply our attention. Um, one of my, uh, Rockenberry used to say to me, he said that the job of the mind is to record information uh, that you may need to pull up, to review, or to plan a strategy of action for something that's coming ahead of you. But other than those things, the mind is not meant to be engaged as much as it is. So what meant to be there is our attention to the moment, what's in front of us. And so entering into this conversation with the sacred or connecting with the, the sense more deeply is who we are is to, is to alter that or to shift that or to quiet the mind through um, like an invocation or a story. One of the stories I've, I've heard from uh, uh, different traditions is this idea of how they understand how we enter this world, where we come from. So in, I would just say in, in modern society, certainly here in the West, um, the, the common mythology that we adopt is that we come into this world and your, uh, your intellect and your interest will be measured through school. <clears throat> and then um, once, the, the, once that is decided what that is, then you'll be given uh, a particular script of options for you to follow in terms of what you do with your life. Um, hopefully you'll fit into one of those, but often uh, people don't fit into one of those because those are, um, those are sourced from the primary mythologies of the culture that one lives in at the time. And one of my favorite uh, audio and book teachers, Joseph Campbell from many years ago, said, if you ever want to know what the predominant mythologies of your society are, look around and see what the tallest buildings are. And if you're not careful, those will be the ones that they ascribe to you. And of course, those are the economic or the commerce centers. You know, hundreds, thousands of years ago, they were the sacred sites, the stone circles, uh, the places of connection with, with uh, the cosmos. Um, and so this way of remembering who we are, the medicine we carry, the, the gift of medicine we carry, is this understanding in, in many indigenous cultures that we come into this realm carrying a gift. It would be as if you looked around uh, the realm of the ancestors and say, boy, they really need this kind of help down there, and I want to bring this. And then I look around my lineage of ancestors or my soul ancestors and say, and I'm going to need your help and your help and your help and your help because you carry the same medicine that I'm taking down there. And so we need to stay connected. And so we come into this world with these uh, ancestral allies um, and this intent to deliver particular gift uh, in such a way that only we can do it. As I say, you, you can't be better than the same way you can't be less than. You can only be who we came here to be or not be that. Um, and yet we're born into a, into a culture, into a society of scarcity and better less than thinking. So we often adopt these, these mythologies and, and you know, by the age of four or five or six, um, for most people, these things are forgotten. Um, and we begin to take on the, the myths of what's happening, the dysfunctions and the, the, uh, the, the lineage of traumas that may follow a particular ancestral line that we're born into. 
Um, and then uh, in the old days, rites of passage ceremonies like the vision quest or the walkabout or hill walking, things like that would be called in, in uh, Europe. Um, every culture had its own method of initiatory rites of passage. And those were really done for the purpose of activating the memory of what was forgotten. To go into nature, to, pr to fast, to pray, to seek vision, um, is, is really to seek uh, a deeper clarity of, of answering the question, who am I? Um, and where am I going? And so this, um, these old rites of passage rituals uh, are ways to, within community, to reactivate those memories. So they're so discovering who you are uh, is not something you gather from more information. It's something that you really remember. Um, and so I want to share a, a poem with you uh, that speaks of this. A uh, little history of the poem. Uh, the poem came out of a story of uh, two different people I worked with, um, both from an indigenous backgrounds. One was a young man who grew up in a village in South Africa. And then when he was eight years old, he moved to Washington, D.C. over here. So all of a sudden you can see that the huge shift in the paradigms of thought and belief to go from indigenous village to Washington, D.C. Um, and the reason I was sitting with him, he was 17, and he had gone down the avenue of uh, pseudo-initiations, which we say drugs, alcohol, gangs, all this kind of, uh, the way initiations will manifest in shadow if, if the culture doesn't provide them in a, in a good way, they'll manifest in a shadowy way. So he'd gone down that road. And... Uh, and I said, uh, as he was talking with me, I said, do you have another name? Because I knew something about his tribe a little bit. And he looked at me oddly and he said, yeah. So what is your other name? He said, well, when I was young, I went to live with my, my grandmother. And she gave me this name. I said, well, you write it down on this piece of paper. And he said, sure. And he wrote down this all the way across the paper, this long name in his tribal language. And I said, read that to me. And what he read had to do with animals and elements and features in the landscape that was encoded in what she saw as an elder in him. This is what I see in you. And, she, and then he got uh, this sad look on his face. And he, and he looked away from me and he said, I remember when I left the village, she told me to follow your name. And I said, have you been doing that? And he said, no. I said, well, we have to figure out how to get you back aligned with this name that you carry, this, this, this identity, this, this way of your belonging to the world. Uh, because your name that she gave you is not a description of you. It's a description of where you are headed. It's a map. Um, and so I discovered this similar practice in other native traditions here on this continent of this other kind of naming where one would receive what we might in, in popular spiritual culture as a medicine name. Um, but these names were meant as roadmaps and uh, that one lives into. Um, and some of you out there in the circle may have even changed your name because the name you carry is one you've outgrown or you took on a name that that has a pathway or an arc to it that says more about where you're heading uh, than where you've been. Um, so I want to share this poem with you that came out of that connection with those two. Uh, one was a young man um, from South Africa, the other one, a young lady from the Seminole tribe here in this country, um, told me a very similar story. So um, and I invite you as you hear this poem uh, to notice where you enter the poem. Maybe I start reading and, and you're not in it right away, but there's something I say and all of a sudden you're in. Or notice in the poem where your attention stops and you don't hear anything else I say, but you're right there with that one phrase, that one word. 
or maybe somewhere in the poem a door opens and you stop hearing my words and you leave this poem and you go into your own story. And so the question is, what door opened here and where did you go in your own story? So it's a way of uh, treating stories as relationships as opposed to the way we're often uh, hear stories as we have to kind of exact some kind of meaning and then put the meaning on the shelf. And then we can say, oh yeah, I heard that story. I know what that means. Or heard that poem. I know what that means. And in medicine stories, it's never about understanding the whole thing. We say if you if you understand the story, then it's dead and it has nothing more to teach you. But the point is to be in relationship with it. Let it move you. Let it stir you. Let it frighten you. Let it excite you. Like notice how in your body what what stirs, what moves. I want to share this poem with you that came out of those experiences and conversations with those two young ones, those two teenagers. It's called Follow Your Name. <laughs> Pay attention. Pay attention. Be careful not to distract yourself from yourself by focusing on the obstacles in your life. Pay attention, pay attention. Be careful not to distract yourself from yourself by focusing on the obstacles in your life. Focus on the delivery of your medicine, not on the stories in your head where you recount your limitations and losses. Do not indulge in such self-importance as a way to avoid taking responsibility for the medicine and the gift of healing you came into this world to offer. You are the heroes and the heroines of your own story. If you are not initiated into the bone memory, into the mythology of your own life, you will likely be living in existence that is not entirely your own. And the life you know you must live is the one standing a few paces in front of you, looking back over its shoulder with eyes wide, waiting for you to remember. Apprentice yourself to yourself and walk to the horizon of your own dreams, the place where you live in the absence of story, the place where the sharp edges of this unfolding moment requires your full attention. Where are you? I am here, you say. Who are you? I am this moment, you reply. Pay attention, pay attention. Stay humble and remain focused. Do not move through the world in such a way as to allow another to give you a name you have no belonging to. Pay attention, pay attention. Stay humble and remain focused. Do not move through the world in such a way as to allow another to give you a name you have no belonging to. So that was a um, poem that came to me in, in working with, uh, partly in working with those two um, in that time, and partly during a dark time of my own life where I had forgotten. Um, Often how the people we meet can offer reflections of, of where we are, the way stories do, where we see ourselves in stories or poems. Um, so it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, uh, stories and poetry is a great ways to kind of enter the mystery, to remember, uh, mm -hmm. to connect more deeply with who we are. It is a beautiful poem. But as you said, if I start commenting on it, I'm afraid that I am going to ruin the magic of it because it was magical. So I'm going to not comment and leave everyone who is watching that and has experienced on a deep level these um, words.
which go beyond the words to just stay with them without me having to have any input into that. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for leaving it open so the listeners can yeah. can kind of move be in relationship with it in their own way. Yeah. Yes. And um, I would invite the listeners to, in asking those three questions, where did I enter the poem for the first time? Or where did I, my attention stop or get keeps getting called back to? Or where did I leave the poem and where did I go when I left it? And we say those are the the three most potent places in in the story of the poem that have the most medicine to offer. And I would offer you one more step once you do that with that with that particular poem is to once you notice that place and, and lean into that. You want to lean in like a tree thirsty for water. You lean into that and really feel it in your body. Let images come to you. Ask yourself the question. In light of this uh, place in the poem that calls my attention, what action am I guided to take right now? Now, I don't mean with your life. Because um, that's a big question. We can get lost in, in um, a big answer. I mean, bring it in close. There's a, a poem by David White called Start Close In that I love. It's like you want to bring it in close in time and space and say, what action am I guided to take in this moment? And it could be in the next 10 minutes, this evening when I get home, uh, later this morning when I go to work, or over the weekend, like keep it close in. And I will say the closer in you bring your response, the more likely it may not make sense what your what the guidance is, but you do it anyway, as long as it's within your integrity to do so. Follow that guidance and then notice what happens next. Um, so it's a way of entering into a, a conversational uh, interchange with that sacred part of yourself and, and with the holy mystery um, that you can follow. Um, and you may be very surprised what, what happens when you, when you do that. Um, so it's a good way to say, to be in relationship with store, medicine stories or, or medicine poems that are, are someone call us uh, to a kind of remembering about who we are. Yes, and <clears throat> I'm sorry. And it is, um, uh, these questions are important. And what you mentioned also is um, how much we owe to our ancestors. We usually tend to dwell into the pain that we inherited from our ancestors, the struggles. Uh, and we try to let go of them, try to do clearings mm -hmm. on emotional and psychological level and whatever, mainly emotional, mm -hmm. so that we can kind of detach from them. But actually, you're even in your invocation ceremony and in this story, you are invited us to embrace the gift of stepping on the shoulders of our ancestors and even to remember that we have our gifts from there. And also we can um, just tune to their presence mm -hmm. and to ask for guidance, especially now, because they can guide you to find this medicine in us. Right. And there's um, some, uh, when doing work with ancestors, let me just put in these pieces of information. Um, this, this idea that from an indigenous perspective, as I've discovered, this idea that we come in carrying gifts, carrying medicine, something that we come in carrying something that's needed here. That's why we show up to these times that we're in. That's part of it. The other is that we come in through particular ancestral bloodlines to hopefully further the healing arc of those lines as they say, to be able to do one better than was done before. Because we are encoded with the dreams and the traumas and the, 
the visions and and but they're but they're moving through us like a, a prism a, a crystal prism that light moves through it's going to arc differently based on the particular individual crystal so it's it's like we are we arc that that light or that information that flows through us like that we say the hollow bone um, and uh, in doing that uh, and I want to put in this this note of disclaimer when we call on ancestors you really want to be specific to call on the ones that are well in spirit in an indigenous culture there is this differentiation that um, being dead doesn't mean you're well <laughs> so you just don't call on anybody that happens to be hanging around. Um, you go back down the line or you, you send the invocation, I, you know, to even say, I call on those uh, ancestors of my bloodline that lived well and died well, those that are well in spirit, to assist me in healing and clearing the troubles between where you are and where I am in the line. So we, we engage in a direct connection an invocation with the well ancestors because there are turmoils and traumas and troubles that that, that live in the line um, and so it's not simply uh, to open the door and call everybody in um, it's a little more exacting than that <laughs> no more than we would go into a, a pub and open doors everybody come home with me it's like maybe you'd get a couple of good people but a lot of people with their own agendas <laughs> Um, and I always uh, also remind people when working with ancestors that the litmus test for a well ancestor, when you, if you're calling in ancestors, is that they don't need anything from you. Yeah. They're not going to have a, a, a whole bunch of things for you to do or requests of you. They're here. It's more like a, a loving grandmother, grandfather. It's like granddaughter, grandson. How, how can I help? It's not, I need you to do this or tell this or, or talk to this person. And, if, if you run into those, then just pass that by. Don't, don't engage those. <laughs> um, but this idea that we do carry uh, the lineage of dreams, of visions, of traumas, of things in our line um, that, you know, require healing, require remembering, and, and how we live our lives can offer that uh, healing. And, and, and also the, the connection in that way to the well ancestors is to think of it that there are blessings and there is medicine that flows through every bloodline. And sometimes these blessings and medicine have been interrupted through any series of events or, or challenges. Um, and so to, to remember more fully who we are is also to, to call upon our well ancestors to restore the blessing and the medicine that flows through that line as every line carries them. And, uh, and as I say, may, and it may require doing not only our own healing work of things that we ha may have encountered as a result of those dysfunctions or traumas in our own life, but sometimes we, we're, uh, well, not sometimes, just know that that's always connected to healing forwards and backwards. Any healing work we do uh, to remember more clearly who we are, uh, clears the line in front of us and behind us more and more and more. Um, and so to invite an uh, in, in, uh, in ancient ancestral grandmother or grandfather to assist in that healing is what really makes that, you know, brings that connection um, and makes it palpable in, in our lives. Yes, I can see. Yes, thank you for that. Um, it never occurred to me too that we can we can call all this, all those that are well mm -hmm. in spirit. Um, in my idea was that we can call upon the gifts of our ancestors in general. Mm -hmm. So it was very important what you mentioned, and <clears throat> healing what is in the way of becoming our true selves, can we say that it's actually becoming our wild indigenous self? Mm -hmm. This is my kind of one question. And um, <clears throat> also, you mentioned that through life, living in a particular culture, 
and especially making the mind the king that rules us, but also that separates us from mm -hmm. one another mm -hmm. and from nature and from our star mm -hmm. ancestors. Um, so this actually domesticated our mm -hmm. true self is not our true self anymore. So, and how we, we move from this domesticated self that is separated from everything to our really wild indigenous self that is one with everything. So this, yeah, so how to shed the, the, the to, to take off the shackles of the domesticated mind and self um, and restore, you know, the, the, the term we were given this wild indigenous self. Um, and so uh, my uh, elder rocking bear, a Cherokee teacher when he was alive, he used to, he used to tell me, he said, I don't believe in anything. Now what he, he was not speaking to nihilism of like, does it matter? He was actually saying, I don't believe in anything so that I can pay attention to everything. Uh, in a long form of explanation, he said, be careful about your beliefs because they become your prisons. And, um, and so our domesticated self is filled with uh, belief prisons that, that limit what we can experience, what we can see, who we can connect with. Um, in, in some attempt to create uh, the illusion of safety um, and the illusion of belonging. Um, these these uh, well constructed beliefs, and I say beliefs. Think of your beliefs as uh, tools, and if they work, use them. And if they don't work, think of picking up another tool. Um, but not being captured or held hostage by our beliefs subconsciously in a way that separates us from uh, connecting and with others and separates us from connecting with ourselves. Um, and so the, the domesticated self is uh, filled with habitual thoughts, habitual feelings, habitual actions, and that run behavior and, um, and, and lots of well-constructed beliefs. Um, and yet there's this thing we're calling the wild indigenous self. And it's like, so what is that? So the word wild does not mean out of control. Um, indigenous actually doesn't refer to a particular peoples. I want to mean it refers to original, that which is original or native, not native as in peoples, but native as in original. So this wild indigenous self is a, is a, quality of uh, self that is authentic. Um, wild refers to a quality of attention that we give our surroundings. Um, and, and wild is a, a, is a, a way of um, giving a way of giving attention to what's around us that is not encoded with so many beliefs or projections. It is uh, uh, like I would invite you to take a walk. If, you, if those of you that can take a walk in nature or in a park, if you're in a city. Um, and during that walk, at the beginning of your walk, we'll call it a medicine walk, um, mark the beginning in some way, like I'm stepping into this um, and I'm available uh, to see more than I can usually see or hear more than I can usually hear. And I may even just mark the ground and step across it or I just set an intention of a certain amount of time and I step into this walk and I just begin walking and noticing and paying attention in a particular way that is more alive. That is, uh, as I say, not simply encoded with projections. Um, 
And a good way to do that is um, while you walk, forget the name of everything you see. And as that means as you're walking, you have no idea what these images are. Um, and then so you're held in a way of uh, perception and engagement relationally that changes the moment you name it. Um, and it's like, I had a conversation, I remember in another interview where the interview, interviewer said, why does magic seem to happen when we go traveling into foreign places? And I thought about that and I said, I think it, it's not that it happens less when we're not traveling in interesting places. It's that we don't have any script or agenda about what's around the corner or what we're looking at. We have no idea what's around the corner. Everything is new. And, and if you don't know the language, everything, it's like everything's a mystery. And so you, we're more available to noticing these interactions uh, that guide us um, that we would normally miss when we have such an agenda or perception about what we're seeing and what it means or, oh, I'm meeting this person and this is what this person is about. But I say, like, what if you met your... Uh, a friend and went for a walk and imagine you've never met this person before and just be in relationship with this one with no story, with no information and notice what you see, what you notice that you may have not seen before and then try it with yourself in the mirror, like looking into the mirror and forget your story about yourself as if you have no idea about any history of this person that you're looking at in the mirror and watch who shows up. Literally, it may uh, physically surprise you what you see. Um, so this domesticated self that we're talking about shifting away from is the shift out of this way of, of habitual thinking, habitual believing, uh, habitual actions. Um, because when we respond habitually, we stay asleep. It, uh, it, it's, it, it, uh, it just kind of keeps us uh, dull and asleep. But the moment we're not responding habitually, we have a way of our attention wakes up and we're more alert and we can notice more. Um, so the wild indigenous self is to move through nature with that kind of attention or even move through the city streets with that kind of attention. Kind of this alive, I think it was Einstein who says, it's like you notice everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle. Like you look at it with this, this way of perceiving that allows this uh, wonder, this, this grandeur of what we're noticing um, to wake up. And these are, are much uh, ways to deeply connect with self. Um, so I'm a uh, rites of passage guide, or what I like to call a ceremonial midwife. And taking people into nature and into a ceremony where for four days and nights they go out, they're prepared to go out on the mountain for four days and nights to fast. Um, and, and there's some ceremonial structure, um, the way of being in relationship to that, to those four days and nights in such a way that um, their attention and their liveness restores to that, what we're calling the wild indigenous self, this way of, uh, heightened uh, clarity, heightened attention, heightened intuitive awareness uh, that can happen in those in those experiences, um, in a way that we we connect more deeply to the memory. Sometimes we remember difficult stuff. I will say because that's what's in the way, and so if if painful things come up, they're just coming up to be released, to be to be offered. Like our, let our tears be an offering. Uh, and so things sometimes rise up as, as to, to move through us and we just let it move through. Um, and on the other side, there's a way of, of connection to self that's much more uh, alive, to, to use that kind of the wild indigenous aliveness. Um, then so. is it um, just because I'm aware about of our time together, but is it... Um, what you're offering, you mentioned already this ceremony is rites of passage uh, and uh, leading people into the so-called death lodge. Is it 
we mm -hmm. need some of these uh, identities that we have acquired and be help us, you know, uh, 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 becoming our domestic domesticated selves. Is it the way that you're leading people from coming out of these identities and stepping into their wild indigenous self? There, there's some of that, you know, we, in, in the experiences we offer, it's 11, 12 days. And so there's like five days of unraveling. Well, that, that term death lodge that you use that we and I've talked about is a, is a reference to these types of ceremonies and rituals that are called rebirth ceremonies and rituals. So um, where we think of life beginning here and, and moving along like a river in this direction, it begins at birth, ends at death in this one lifetime, we say. Um, initiation or rites of passage begins over here and runs opposite in that it begins with a death or a severance and ends with a birth or a new. Um, and so, um, like on, on our website, I, I think the first thing that's seen is um, great journeys begin in darkness. It's that severance, that uh, severance from the familiar, what's called the death lodge, poor piece, where things begin falling away. Now, I have had people come show up uh, in circle with us that have literally been in a severance death lodge phase for a year or even two years, lost a job, lost a marriage, Lost, you know, lost, 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 and they're just broken down, broken open, and they're just, you know, hands open, heart empty, you know, they, they've been in the death lodge, they've been in the severance, um, and they show up, and then others that may not understand that show up, and then they, there's a process that begins to dismantle within themselves, where they begin to examine, you know, what are the things I want to put down? And what are the things I want to pick up? Um, and, you know, so going up on the mountain, we say we, you go up on the mountain, not simply for yourself, but for your people, human and non-human, um, that you remember more completely who you are and the gifts you carry so that when you return, uh, there is this giveaway, there is this offering. Yes, and... Um... Uh, it's a very timely uh, reminder that um, usually the darkness that we are entering sometimes leads to uh, stepping, us stepping into the light. Yeah. So I think that everyone will, can take this uh, into consideration because probably many people are just quite confused in these times now. Yeah. yeah. So, well, it doesn't necessarily require four days. You know, you can, as I say, you can do this in a, in a, try it for an hour in a walk in the park. Just set the intention, step into the walk. Yeah. In, in the way that I guided. Yes. Uh, earlier and, and enter into briefer conversations where you don't have to think, oh, I don't have time to take 12 days out of my life to do this. But so take smaller moments. Yeah, very beautiful advice and very beautiful and enlightening conversation but because we just I would have continued with great pleasure but uh, we only have a few minutes uh, left and uh, I want to give you the opportunity to say several words about your free gift which is a story to the center of the soul and people can claim this free gift uh, right in the link right uh, under below this video. Just two words. Uh, uh, so it's an audio drumming story, which I use the uh, drum, myself and the drum tell a story. It's called Singing Stone. And it's the story of the initiatory journey. Okay. Uh, so I can invite everyone to claim this free gift because I have experienced Kader's uh, stories about the river and uh, this is a different story what he's offering and it's uh, uh, very experiential and very special. So really claim this free gift from Kader. And thank you so much <clears throat> for being here oh, today. Thank you for the opportunity. In this indigenous wisdom because for me, you're just a wisdom keeper and uh, <clears throat> helping in many ways to people, combining the modern 
knowledge, scientific knowledge with this indigenous wisdom of the elders and thank you. And um, I wish you all the best and I invite everyone to just um, uh, take the most out of this conversation because it was just very, very fruitful. Thank you again. Thank you very Thank much. You. Wish everybody well. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Bye-bye.